we are going to talk about malware today. So, we are going to talk about several things. One of the most interesting things, well, how to set up your own sandbox. I'm going to show you, let's say, how I have mine set up. And then, we're going to take random malware samples from the latest stuff out there, and we're going to analyze them. I don't know them, you don't know them. So it's going to be interesting to be able to do the analysis of those samples that we don't know. So, well, let's start by explaining a little bit about test environments. Normally, to be able to analyze malware, you should have what is normally called a sandbox. That is to say a sandbox, where you can take that sample, run it, analyze it, and nothing bad happens. That it's not going to affect your machine. That it is not going to affect the network where you are connected. And that we're not going to damage anything, because that's not the idea. There is very virulent malware, very dangerous, that if you make a mistake, it's going to be the last one on your machine. So after that, you have to reinstall the operating system, etc. So, well, there are several ways to create your virtual lab. Your virtual lab, your labs. One of those is virtualization. I use virtualization for most cases. But sometimes it happens that you need to do some testing on a malware. Thank you very much for the follow. Thank you very much. Sometimes you need an environment where the malware does not detect that it is in a virtualization. There is very advanced malware that is able to detect that you're running in a virtual environment and so is not completely decrypted, does not run all the processes of encrypted, so you will not understand it completely. So you're going to have to, in some cases, use a physical lab. There are some automated labs also where, well, through virtualizations, or chemotype emulations. You can also work machines, but in this case, we are going to use a virtual lab. We are going to use two virtual machines to be able to do the tests. I am going to show you some of the most effective tools. Personally, I really like to use Remnux. See? Remnux is a virtual machine that you can also use as a docker even to be able to do malware analysis. I'm going to show you a little bit Remnux is the one we are going to use today. It is totally free. You can download it. And in the chat, I'm going to share with you in a moment the download link so you can see it. Let me take the link of the Remnux and I'm going to put it in the chat so that you can see. And those who want to download it have it. Remnux is a very good distro. As you can see, because it can also work in containers in Docker. So you will have no problem. Now I think I can lower my camera without problem a little bit here. Done. Then, because you simply have to get into the page. Well, here I have some script blocks. Let's let it run scripts. And well, you can download it as you need it. You can download the virtual machine, which is what I have. Or you can download it as a Docker and doubt. Manage it in containers. So Remnux is a Linux. It is an Ubuntu. At this moment, we are in the 2004. And right now I'll show you is the one we are using. Well, there are some automated testing environments, a little bit of those sandbox that we use. Total virus type, any run type, hybrid analysis type, etc. Cuckoo sandboxes that allow us to do, let's say, automated analysis without us taking any risk. It is an alternative. There are many online sandboxes. Here we have some total virus, Jyoti, virus scan. Microsoft has even its own sandbox. There are many many. Today, I'm going to show you a couple of them, maybe. Any run, which is very nice, it's very interesting. But it's up to you, which one you want to use. If you're going to do it online, today we're going to do it directly on our workstation. The physical environments are very useful because they allow you to bypass the control mechanisms that the anti-malware have. Anti-malware has some techniques that are called, or sometimes come with some techniques that are called anti-forensics. Why do they do it? So that we can't understand what they do. You see? So as I tell you, a lot of times malware detects that it's in a virtual environment. A few years ago for B-Sides, I gave a lecture where I talked about advanced malware stealth techniques. It is on the internet, if you want to take a look. That lecture is on the internet. It is on SlideShare. It's nice because there I explain several of the techniques, several of the most advanced malware of that time. But still, those techniques are still in force. So look, you just look for SlideShare, David Pereira. I really want to put on my GitHub all my 
lectures because sometimes people find them on SlideShare, but sometimes is suddenly more effective on GitHub. So, look, the lecture is called Advanced Malware Hiding Techniques. So, let's see, here it should be. I think... This is Advanced Malware Hiding Techniques. And there I explain in that lecture changing the image changes everything. Okay? In that lecture, I explain, well, what are those advanced techniques that the malware uses? Among them, detecting that it is running in a virtual machine, and that makes the malware not to decrypt completely or not to show you its decryption keys. So, many times, automated malware scanning tools do not detect that there is a malware inside. Basically, that's why the malware managed to detect that it's running inside a virtualization or inside an emulation, and it doesn't decrypt. Then it becomes very dangerous. It's one of the most dangerous things out there because you can be fooled into thinking that there's no problem, that is a sample, that there's nothing wrong with it. There are some barking dogs. I hope they're okay. Well, look, there are many obfuscation techniques. It is a very nice lecture. I liked it when I gave it. And well, one of the techniques is to detect virtualization. So that's why sometimes it becomes much better to, to use a physical computer. The problem is that you infect it, and then what? See, that's the problem, because you damage the machine. Then you have to have a backup hard disk, make the image of the damaged hard disk, sorry, from the hard disk that is intact to the hard disk where the operating system that is damaged is, etc. It's imagine with ransomware. So that's why we use virtualization so much. What are we going to do today? A virtual test environment. We're going to work a Remnux machine, the latest version. Version 7 is the one that's currently being worked on. And then a Windows 10. The Windows 10 we downloaded from Microsoft Virtual Machines. It has nothing unbelievable. Just plain and simple. Yes, very good question, Grunt. If you could use a Raspberry Pi. Yes, perfectly well. It would serve you your Raspberry Pi. You connect it in an isolated environment, along with your, with your virtual machine Remnux. Then you can use the virtual Remnux so that all the network traffic is sent to, to the Remnux. And that's it. Good, good, good. Black Salesmaster. Great nickname. Nice one. Then it's a good thing you made it. So then the Raspberry Pi becomes great because it allows you to do that. So you connect the Raspberry Pi on one side and your Remnux on the other side on the same network. You can use even a tiny little wireless router. You connect them both there. So you have a totally isolated environment and you're not going to infect anything. So, well, let's look at a little bit of what we have here. We have a Remnux that I downloaded from the Remnux URL that I gave you. This is the last one, the last one out there. You can tell it in LSB, an LSB underscore release. Minus A to show us what version we have is a 2004, the focal. Several ways to know what operating system you are working with. I've already talked about this at other times in YouTube videos, but well, it's much cooler when I have people here live to be able to interact. But then we have also the cat slash etc slash issue that also allows you to see which version of Ubuntu you are using or the uname minus A. That will also help you to get an idea about the kernel. And well, everything that you have at the level of, of the operating system, the bits that you are using, the version, because we are using a 64 bits and Ubuntu, and we have it in an isolated environment, completely closed with a Windows 10 that we have over here. You can create your own sandbox. It turned off because obviously it is the Windows machine that Microsoft offers you virtual that you can download directly from Microsoft. I don't know if you have seen that Microsoft offers you virtual machines that you can download and they are valid for 60, 90 days, which is a great thing. At the end, I'm going to put this link if you want to see the slides. If you want to see them eventually, I'm going to put this link and well, Microsoft offers virtual machines for you to test the browsers, to test the edge, and downloads directly from Microsoft. So the chance of getting infected or catching a malware, it is very low, almost non-existent, because you're going to download it directly from the Microsoft developers page. You see, then you have here, 
the possibility. I'm going to place this link also in the chat. 2. To download them. Then, you are simply going to tell it which virtual machine you want. See? I'll enable the scripts now. Done. Then look. Here you have the ability to say, well, I want an Internet Explorer 8 on a Windows 7, or an Internet Explorer 11, or a Windows 8, or a, or the Windows 10, which is what I downloaded from 64-bit stable with the Edge. So that's what I have, and you can even choose what virtualization platform you're going to use normally. Well, normally almost always, I think it's downloaded as an OVA, which is compatible with anything. It's compatible with either VirtualBox or VMware. I use VMware. You can use the free version of VMware, which is VMware Player, which is free. The only problem is that you will not be able to make adjustments to the virtual machines. There are no snapshots, so let's say it is not so recommended. You can use VirtualBox if you have the money to pay. Or I think that VMware, if you are a student and you contact them, they can give you a very good discount on the license. A VMware workstation, which is an excellent tool. I use Fusion, so I have Mac, which is the same as workstation, but for Mac, then well, we have our Windows 10 here. Normally, the password for this machine, when you download it from Microsoft, is password, but it's capital P-A-S-S-W-C-R-O-R-D, an exclamation point. And on this machine, I have certain tools installed that are already, let's say, ready for us to be able to do our, our, our exercises of the use of the machine. In this case, well, we are going to install several things of tools of anti-malware, of malware analysis. Sorry, not of anti-malware, but of malware analysis. One of the things I would recommend the most is that you install a tool that allows you to configure your network card or your IP address. Actually, not the network card, but the IP address. Why? Because you will need to make adjustments. One of the settings that I normally do is that I have the two potential environments to be able to update my machine or to be able to download things from the internet which would be a direct connection from the clean snapshot. One of the first things you have to do is create a clean snapshot without any kind of infection, which is what you're going to go back to after you've infected the machine, right? And then in that snapshot, you're going to have all your tools installed. One of them is NetSetman, which is a free tool, NetSetman, that allows you to configure all the IP addresses that you want on your machine. You see? So here I have two possible... IPs, I have one for internet, where plain and simple is DHCP, to take the addressing of my local network and can go out internet, or the one that is active right now. If you notice it is active, is active, Sandbox, you see, it is the one that has the checkmark. So Sandbox is a local IP address, 191.68.10.3, that has as a gateway the 192.1.68.10.2, which is my Remnux. So, you see, we are in a controlled environment with each other. Look, if I show you the IP of my Remnux, it is the 192.168.10.2. Then they see only each other. And in the connection part, in the virtualization, I have them host only. So they are only seen between them. I can't see them from my physical machine. And nobody from the outside could see them either. So, there we have a closed environment that when I infect one of the machines with one of the samples that we download from the internet... So nothing will happen with my physical machine or with the machines that are on the network, and I will not have a headache, you see? So, we must always have a secure operating environment. You see? This is basically standard operational procedure SOP. It's basically that you should be safe or secure when you're doing malware analysis because you don't know how virulent one of the samples that you download can be, so you can be sure how did I make the configuration of the network card of Ubuntu? Well, very simple. As this is a new version, now Ubuntu uses something called NetPlan. Look, is very easy. Is almost the same as before. You can simply go to ETC and look for NetPlan. And inside NetPlan, then I have the different connection possibilities. I have the one that is being used is now using YAML files. You see, it is a YAML file that you have with the network configuration. So look, the one I have right now is the sandbox configuration. If I show you cat01netcfg.yaml, see super simple configuration. So here I have just which my Ethernet interface, the NS33, which is the default interface that Ubuntu is using, has the address 
10-2 with a network submask of 24 bits. That is 255-255-2550. You see? And the gateway that I'm using is the 192.168.10.1. Wouldn't really matter there. And the DNS server, the 10.1 doesn't even exist. Wouldn't be a problem. And worst case scenario, the virtualization would put it, look, if I ping to the 192.168, sorry, 168.10.1, well, look, the virtualization takes care of doing, would take care of at a certain point in time if necessary to put it in. But look, it doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. 10.1. There's not going anywhere in the traffic there. It doesn't matter. What about the Mac? And when I need, for example, to update the Remnux, I need to tell it Remnux. Update, for example, which is one of the of the commands that you're going to use. The Remnux update. Sorry, update. To update your Remnux. Because there, I would need an internet connection, which I don't have. You see? Then, for that, I would have to change the configuration of the network card of the Remnux so that it does go out to internet. Because at this moment, if I give a ping to Google, for example, there is no way. There is no resolution. There is nothing. I have no connectivity to the outside. In order for me to have connectivity to the outside, I would have to activate the Remnux network card, where I have another configuration file. Look, it is called Sarah1.yaml. I think it is the dot old one, the configuration. Old, look, just, I have, in the interface, I tell it DHCP, yes. So, when I activate that configuration, we will be able to go out to the internet. You see, how do you activate it? Changing the active file, you just have to say sudo cp. The old, right? Then I would have to say blah, 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 old to net yaml. Enter and give it a reboot. You could try a reboot of the network, but I prefer to do the full reboot. You could say sudo slash etc init, init, slash network manager restart, but I prefer to do a full reboot of the machine, and you will realize that it will change the IP address, etc., etc. And well, at a certain point, we would be able to access the internet, etc. Then, that's what you should do for when you need to update your Remnux. Otherwise, you keep it inside the closed network against your Windows machine, and that's it. Then you see that in the Windows machine, we continue with our internal IP.